Hello, ma'am. Can we help? Oh, I can't breathe. I'm having a hard time. Oh, I'm here to help. Oh, oh, you're breathing fast. Just put this down your hole. What? Put that what? In, just, just, what are you just, doing? Please, let me help you, ma'am. No, Jesus Christ, what's wrong with you? Okay. First is always establishing safety. I want to make sure I have the appropriate body substance isolation measures in place, the PP necessary to accomplish that. And for training purposes, we're not going to have anything on. However, uh, we would want to make sure I have uh, gloves, mask, and uh, eye protection. And on the patient, also have some sort of uh, mask as well to mitigate uh, any germs the patient is blowing off. Going on with that. So uh, you come in and have a patient who's experiencing obvious respiratory distress. Okay, so if the patient is not in a good position, for example, they're slumped or otherwise in a bad position, I want to sit them upright and maximize their uh, ease of breathing. Also want to consider applying O2. Then with the patient, I want to do a baseline set of vitals. So the first thing I want to look at is obvious distress level. If the patient can speak, I can ask it on a scale of 1 to 10. Otherwise, I want to get a benchmark. How bad do they look? I'd like to also go with a respiratory rate, depth, effort. I want to look for a breathing pattern to see if they're retaining or if they're panting. And I want to listen to lung sounds. I want to get skin signs. Uh, skin signs are critical, especially cool pale diaphoretic might lead me to believe there's pulmonary edema right off the bat. I want to get a pulse ox reading. ECG, CAPNO, BP, and pulse rate. Uh, these are all things I would get in combination with my team and get my, essentially, where I'm starting. So how does CPAP <clears throat> help COPD, asthma, bronchitis, <clears throat> pneumonia, and pulmonary edema from left-sided heart failure? CPAP is continuous positive airway pressure and through use of a valve and uh, an O2 or airflow system, it provides inspiratory airway pressure and it provides expiratory airway pressure. It helps four main ways. On the inspiratory part of CPAP, it helps reduce the work of breathing, so essentially helping air get in. The other part of CPAP is it uh, creates a positive pressure during expiration. Uh, when the patient ex ex uh, tries to exhale, that pressure keeps the airway splinted so it can reduce the wheezing that comes during expiration. It also helps recruit the alveoli even better and at approximately a, a 10 centimeters of water you'll get maximum alveolar distension which itself improves oxygenation and ventilation. Essentially improves the diffusion of gases. And finally through the expiratory uh, resistance of CPAP in cases of pulmonary edema CPAP acts uh, sort of like a nitroglycerin uh, through pressure and that is it reduces preload to the heart which allows the left heart to uh, vacate any fluid in the lungs. So for my indications, indications for CFAP is going to be trouble breathing. We don't know exactly what the cause is a lot of times and uh, but CPAP will work for Bronchospasm, the bronchospasm could be due to asthma, it can be due to upper respiratory tract infections such as pneumonia, it can be due to a COPD exacerbation, a mix of those. It is also indicated for a post drowning syndrome if there is reflexive or reactive airway or spasm or edema, and in pulmonary edema, secondary to left sided heart failure, uh, CPAP is fantastic. When it comes to left sided heart failure, the magic of CPAP is in reducing the preload to the right side of the heart and giving the left side of the heart a break. This will work in cases of um, cardiomyopathy, AMI, or other weakness of the uh, left ventricle. If the heart rate is very slow or very fast, typically below 50 or above 150, the rate itself may be the problem. In that case, CPAP will not be effective will want to uh, deal with the rate first and solve the rate issue. So contraindications for CPAP. In Riverside County, uh, the contraindication on age is anyone appearing to be 14 or less. Um, the other contraindications are if you have hypotension, if you have a BP of lower than 90, again referring to the preload issue, CPAP may lower that pressure. If you have a tension pneumothorax, uh, CPAP may worsen the pneumothorax and cause again worsening of the patient. If the patient isn't conscious or cooperative, 
CPAP's not going to work. If the patient is not breathing on their own or breathing effectively, CPAP will not work. If the patient has essentially fluids like blood or vomit, nausea, essentially things that will cause them to bleed or vomit into the mask and create a choking hazard, CPAP's not going to work. If they have a severe trauma or facial deformities, head deformities that prevents the mask from getting an airtight seal, CPAP will not work. So setting up the CPAP, <clears throat> I've established a need for it. We need to get the O2 supply, which we have. We have the regulator, the pressure control valve, and the tubing. I have my tubing extended. I want to make sure my harness is set. I want to adjust my pressure to five on the adjustable valve here. It goes five in the blue, seven and a half in the yellow, and ten in the green. So back it up to five, which is the lowest setting. Connect it. And, ma'am, I'm going to apply this to your face. It's going to be the mask at CPAP or continuous positive airway pressure. You may have seen this on TV with people at uh, sleep apnea. So this is something that works really well. It's going to be noisy. And it's going to feel a little bit like sticking your head out of a car window while you're driving. Are you ready for this? Okay, so here's the noise part. And now as I approach the patient, <clears throat> I'll turn this off for purposes of instruction. I have three ways I can approach this. For the patient who's completely cooperative, then I want them to help uh, put the CPAP to their face to minimize their anxiety, to make them feel like they're part of the treatment. So Jim, would you go to help uh, hold this to your face and let's see how that feels. Mm -hmm. And you okay with this? Mm -hmm. Perfect. So then I would just continue and with the aid of my partner securing the head uh, harness to her face or to her head. If she's a little more weak or unable to help me but still cooperative, she still understands what's going on, I can do the same thing. But at this point, I'm going to help you hold the mask and if you just want to put your hands in there and help me too. And once again, go through the same steps. And you're doing okay with this? Perfect. And then finally for the patient who's an extremis, who has uh, basically complete confidence and or is unable to help, then we'll go ahead and just apply the mask. So, we come here and go ahead and place it here. How's that feeling so far? You may feel a little airborne on your eyes, we'll take care of that. We'll hold the mask. These fasteners here and adjust the straps. The most common mistake with applying the CPAP mask is not putting it on tight enough. And how does it feel as far as your eyes? Uh, if I need to, I would adjust the strap here. Now I want to see are you feeling better or the same or worse? Mm -hmm. Would you feeling worse? You need more? Okay. So we can apply, uh, increase it and increase it two and a half to five. And let that sit for a little bit and see how that works, okay? At this time, <clears throat> want to go ahead and do a complete reassessment so I, I should have her connected to the monitor and pulse ox. So I'm going to recheck her respiratory rate. Want to listen to lung sounds again. Look at the effort and look at signs of obvious distress. And she's going to be able to tell me she's doing better or worse. Feel a pulse rate. Check for skin sign progression. And um, SpO2 and catenography. If I have my catenography on, it'll start to wash out after a while, so it won't be there for a while. Finally, I want to go ahead and get a 12 lead going to see if there's an underlying heart condition that I need to treat. Now I'm going to turn this off. I'm going to take this off you. Okay, what is REMSA's maximum pressure, PTC, and with 
base hospital contact. Okay, so prior to contact, the maximum pressure we can use in Riverside County is going to be 15 centimeters of water, which is, we have the 5 to 10, we have a 12 and a half, and we have a 15 centimeter adapter. With base hospital contact, I can increase it up to 20. If bronchospasm is present, what could you do? Bronchospasm is present, I would treat it with a nebulizer. I can give a bronchodilator such as albuterol, which would be my first line uh, agent, and I can also go with atrovent. Will albuterol speed up the heart or atrovent dry out the bronchioles? As any paramedic should know, albuterol is beta-2 selective, which is, again, uh, essentially isolated to the muscles of the lungs, and it relaxes a smooth muscle and may indeed actually lower the heart rate because it makes the work of breathing easier. That said, if you give albuterol and give another albuterol and keep giving albuterol, you can become non-beta-2 selective and then it can actually cause beta-1 effects and uh, increase the heart rate. Atrovent is an anticholinergic that causes smooth muscle relaxation via a different mechanism or parasympathetic effect and it was engineered specifically to avoid drying of the bronchi. The only areas where atrovent will cause uh, drying may be in the nose and mouth. Demonstrate how to attach a nebulizer to the CPAP circuit. Okay, so if I need to attach a nebulizer, at the bottom of our CPAP units we have a blue valve here. So I would just take my acorn and put whatever medications I needed in there, insert it, and I need to make sure I attach the other end to a separate O2 source and run it up to six liters a minute or so. If the, patient, if the patient appears to worsen or BP drops below 90, what would you do? If after putting everything on the patient does get worse, I can uh, lower the pressure or just disconnect the CPAP entirely. At this point, it's time to reassess and find out uh, what is wrong from the top. So if you detect an MI or suspect pulmonary edema is due to left-sided heart failure, what would you do? If I uh, suspect an MI or for that matter a uh, 12 lead comes back showing a STEMI, then I would incorporate those protocols. So in the case of an MI, obviously adding aspirin and nitro and fentanyl to the picture and looking for uh, base hospital direction in terms of destination. And if it's a left-sided heart failure with pulmonary edema, then I don't want to forget my actual nitroglycerin. Uh, which is going to be, I can give it transmucosally in the mouth as well as transdermally. That's it. Okay.